after lines, the second most fundamental tool that we need to use in calculus is the function. Schematically, a function is like kind of a machine that takes in an input, does something to it, and gives us out an output. With the caveat that we always get the same output when we give it the same input. So maybe if we had some, we'll call our function f, it takes in something, probably an x over here, and gives us some variable y over here. The way the book puts it, a function is a relationship between these two variables, x and y, x being the input variable, also called the independent variable. and y being the dependent variable, the output. The idea here being that x can be whatever we want it to be, that it doesn't have any restrictions on it, so it's independent of anything else. But y depends on what x value we, pl we plug into the function. Usually we'll just be using numbers here. We, we're not going to really consider the, the broader possibilities of what functions can be. This is actually a very general concept that's used in all over the place in mathematics. But for us, it's just basically going to be dealing with numbers, taking a number and giving us, giving us a brand new number. And the notation that we're going to use here is that y equals f of x. This is read f of x. f is the name of the function, f of x is the value of the function at the number x. And a lot of times we'll, we'll just we'll just write the function, we might not even name the, the output variable, the, the, the dependent variable. We'll just have f of x equals some formula in terms of x. Now one question might be is if, if we already have an equation that relates x and y together, like we, we've been seeing a lot of these when we're dealing with, with graphing equations, we had an equation involving an x and y, and the question here is when is that going to be a function? When does it represent a function? Normally that will boil down to whether or not we can solve for y, because usually we want to have y be the, the dependent variable and x be the independent variable. Let's look at a couple of examples of this. Let's look at problem 5. Problem 5, they give us the equation x squared plus y is equal to 4. And the question here is, is this y a function of x? Can we solve for y? Well, in this case, it's pretty easy. We can go ahead and sub just subtract x squared from both sides. We get y is equal to 4 minus x squared. And we already have it as y is some formula in terms of x. If I plug in a particular value of x, I will get a unique value of y out from this formula. In other words, I can say this is, represents the function f of x is equal to 4 minus x squared. On the other hand, if we look at a problem like problem 8, this time our formula that they give us is x squared y times y squared minus 3x squared plus 4y squared is equal to 0. This is a little bit more complicated of a formula than we had in problem 5, but we can go ahead and try to solve for y. I'm going to take all the terms that do not involve y to the other side, specifically that means this 3x squared, I'm going to add over here. So we have x squared y squared plus 4y squared is equal to 3x squared. All the terms over here have a y squared in them, so I can go ahead and factor out the y squared. So I have x squared plus 4, all that is times y squared. Over here we still have the 3x squared, nothing's changed there. Then I can go ahead and just divide by the x squared plus 4. We're not going to worry too much right at the moment whether or not we'd be dividing by zero, but sometimes we might have to pay attention to that. But we're just trying to see if, if 
we can even do it in the first place. If we can even solve for y in the first place. Now the last thing that we'd have to do here, we still we don't have y, we have y squared, so let's take the square root. We could write this as y is equal to the square root of 3x squared over x squared plus 4. Except we do have to worry about pluses or minuses. This is plus or minus the square root. And that's actually the, a problem. Does, do we have a function here? Well, no, because we have the plus or minus, there, for any given value of x that I were to plug into here, I could possibly get two values of y, the, the positive value and the negative value. And that violates our major rule for functions, that whenever we plug in a number, we get a unique number out. We cannot get multiple, multiple outputs from the same input. This equation does not represent a function, this equation that we started with. Now, that can be a little bit subtle. It, it, it can be really easy to miss stuff like that. The pluses or minuses, maybe some, some problems involving other operations that, that don't really invert the way we might expect them to. But a lot of that can actually be made clear if we look at the graph. So let's go ahead and graph our equation from problem 5. So that, that was x squared plus y is equal to 4. And we get this, this curve. The important things ab about this curve is that if we want it to be a function, that means for any particular x value that I plug into my formula, I should get a unique value of y out. That means for any given x value along my x-axis, if I look at points on the curve that are above or below it, I should only ever get one particular y value that, cor that is on this graph. In this particular case, that, that's, that's perfectly satisfied. We already showed that this is a function, so we don't really have to do anything more there. On the other hand, if we look at the equation from problem 8, that was x squared times y squared plus, or sorry, minus 3x squared plus 4y squared is equal to 0. We get this particular curve. Well, you might even say it's two curves. But the point here is that this is the graph of that equation. Every point on this, on this that's actually shown here does satisfy that equation. But if we were to look at, say, at 1, there are two y values. Not entirely sure what, what they are, but there's two y values that correspond to x equals 1. And that's a problem. That, that's why we actually do not have a function here. It violates that rule. Now, one, one easy way to see this is to look at vertical lines. Vertical lines represent all the points that have that same x value. So if I were to look at the line x equals 1, that is a vertical line that hits my, hits my graph more than once. And that, that represents the problem here. If we, if we were to look, say, at our problem 5 graph, this vertical line hits it only one time. And if that's always true, then we're good. We're, we have a function. That's actually something that's called the vertical line test. Basically, if we graph a, an equation and we look at vertical lines on that graph, if it, if it ever hits that graph more than one time, then we do not have a function. Now, we can't really necessarily say the reverse, because, well, if we, if we look at this graph, maybe something happens off screen. Maybe we just don't know everything about this graph, or not everything about the equation based off of what we've seen. Maybe something just is not, maybe there is a problem that we just don't see on the, on the, on the picture. But if we ever do find a problem, if we ever do find a vertical line that hits it more than once, then we automatically know it's not a function. And that, that's the point of the test. 
when we're working with functions, it is frequently important to know what can be put into the function. Not all functions are defined for every value of x that we could try to plug, plug into them. So the, the set of all input values for where a function is defined is called its domain. A lot of functions, something like f of x is equal to, let's say, f x to the fifth power plus 3x squared plus 2. This has domain all real numbers. If I were to pick any number, any, num any real number, we're not going to work with complex numbers here, or imaginary numbers or anything like that. If we were to pick any real number and put it into this formula, we get another number out. There is no problem with doing that. say domain all real numbers or or there's a, actually a, a fancy notation for real numbers you can also say it's a set of all of of r a fancy fancy r but sometimes the, this not the case. Maybe not all functions have domain all real numbers. There's there's some problems that can that can arise. So things to watch for. Things like dividing by zero is a problem. If ever we have our formula written out for our function and it requires us to divide by zero for a particular input, then that number cannot be part of our domain. Two, we can have a negative under the square root. Now that's partially is because we're only going to be dealing with real numbers. If we're allowed complex numbers, we could have negatives under the square root, but we don't want to even touch complex numbers in this course. Uh, dealing with calculus of complex numbers is a whole nother thing entirely. We don't even want to talk about that right now. So anytime we have a negative under the square root, that is a problem and we need to exclude that from our domain. I also specifically say here a square root. This does not apply to, say, cube roots. The cube root of, say, negative 1 is literally negative 1, because negative 1 cubed is negative 1. So square roots are a problem. And that, that also involves fourth roots. The fourth root is really the square root of a square root. So that that is that still in, is included. So any even root, odd roots are fine because negatives there can actually be pulled out. Three, zero, or a negative. Inside a logarithm. Now, you've probably actually seen logarithms before. We definitely talk about them in college algebra. We're not going to be doing anything with them in this class for a long time. Um, in fact, I think it's, yeah, in chapter 5. Chapter 5 it, it involves a lot of exponential and logarithmic stuff. So we'll... we'll wait. No, chapter 4. I got that wrong. Chapter 4, we'll actually be talking about exponential functions and logarithms. We won't be doing anything with them until then. But if when we get to logarithms, we'll see that we cannot put 0 inside a logarithm, and we can't put a negative number inside a logarithm. Just kind of similar to the square root. That, that, that just can't be done. And so that those are those are really the main three things to watch out for. If any of those happen, we have to exclude some numbers, or we're going to get, or things are just going to blow up. They're just, it's not going to work. So let's go ahead and actually do a couple problems where we find the domain of some functions. Let's look at problem 23. Problem 23, we have f of x is equal to x minus 2 over x plus 4. 
So for most values of x, I can go ahead and plug it into this formula, and I get a result. But there, but we want to ask ourselves what numbers would be a problem. If we, what 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 numbers would cause things to to break if we tried to put it, them into this formula? Now, of course, we don't have any square roots or logarithms in this formula, but we definitely do have division, and that's the thing we kind of want to focus on. We just don't want to divide by zero. So are there any x's that would make the denominator equal to zero? In this particular case, it might be easy enough to just guess the answer, but for something more complicated, we might have to turn this into an equation. We have the, we have this stuff on bottom here, this x plus four. We'll take that x plus four and we'll set it equal to zero. If, if this equation is ever satisfied, if we can find any solutions to this equation, then those are things that we're going to have to exclude from our domain to make this work. Now this one's easy enough to solve. We just move the 4 to the other side, so x equals negative 4. x equals negative 4 would cause this formula to break. And so we need to exclude negative 4 from our domain. So our domain here is all real numbers except negative 4 which we can write in a few ways. Um, if we were being a little bit lazy about it, we might just put x is not negative 4 in braces. We're just talking about the set of numbers that do not equal negative 4. If we want to be very careful there, we might say specifically that x has to be a real number. Say x is, is in the set of all real numbers such that x is not equal to negative 4. That's being a little bit more specific because technically you could say, I don't know, a shoe does not equal negative four. So, so do, does that in, is in, is a shoe included in our, in our domain? But that doesn't make any sense since we only want to be talking about numbers. But that's getting a little into more set theoretical stuff rather than calculus. The other thing we could do here is use interval notation. So. The interval notation for just excluding negative 4 would be, we had the interval from negative infinity to negative 4, but we'd also have the interval from negative 4 to infinity. And we, we'd use a, a little U-shaped thing, it's called a union, where we're including both of those, those intervals. Really, I just go ahead and put that, put the x is not equal to negative 4 most of the time. But the... I'm not sure what the, the online homework is going to, what format they're going to have you to use for that. They might ask specifically for interval notation. Next, let's, let's look at problem 20. Kind of going backwards here, but it is actually a slightly more complicated problem. Here, f of x is equal to x divided by the square root of x minus 9. We're still looking for the domain of this function. Just like here, we have a, a division, so we're going to have to worry about that. But we also have a square root. We need to deal with both of those. Let's start with the division. Where is the bottom of this fraction equal to 0? Basically, where is the square root of x minus 9 equal to 0? Well, we can square both sides. We don't have to worry about plus or minuses since it equals 0 anyways. We get x, x minus 9 is equal to 0. We can bring the 9 over to the other side. And so x equal 9 is a problem spot. We need to exclude 9 from our domain because it would make the bottom of this fraction equal to 0. What about negatives under the square root? We can turn that into an inequality. We need that x minus 9 to be greater than or equal to 0. If that's not true, then we have a negative under this square root. If we go ahead and simplify that a little bit, we have that x has to be bigger than or equal to 9. We're just moving the 9 over, same way we do with, with equalities. So we need x to be greater than or equal to 9, or we're going to have a negative under the square root. But we also have to exclude 9 from our domain. So that really means that we're going to have to say that x is greater than 9. 
equal to doesn't work. So our dom domain in this case is everything that's left, the stuff that's greater than greater than nine, which we can go ahead and write similar to what we did up here, just in curly braces. Right, x is greater than nine, or we could be more fancy about it, specify here that x is a real number that's greater than nine. Or it, the interval notation here is not too bad. It's just from nine to infinity. And we're putting a, a parentheses here instead of a bracket because we are not including nine. If this was just x is greater than or equal to nine, we would we'd have a bracket there to to infinity. But that that's this is not not correct for this particular function. We also have what we call the range of a function. The range is in some ways the opposite of the domain. It's a set where the domain was a set of all possible input values that we're allowed to use. The, the range is a set of all possible output values. And while we were able to work with find the domain of a function, it was actually really easy to break it down to three problem spots. Ranges are actually a little bit more tricky. There's not really a, an easy way to to specify what the range is going to be. Now, one thing we could try to do is to solve for x. So if we if we have y is equal to x squared plus minus Four. Let's say we have that. If we, tr if we try to solve for x, maybe we could get, maybe we could treat this as x is a function of y instead of y being a function of x. Basically, swap the the which one's the the independent and which one's the dependent variable. If if we can do that, then the range of our original function will be the domain of the new function. However, that's not always possible. In fact, it's not even possible for the one that I've I've written here. So that's usually not the way we're going to be going about doing that. Really, the best way to talk about range, and this is this is a little less exact than we'd like it to be, but the the best way is to look at the graph. Take for an example the problem problem twenty that we just worked with. So in that in that case, we had a function f of x, which was x divided by the square root of x minus nine. Now we kind of have to move stuff around here. So one thing we can note right away, and this this ties into what we just did, this function, the the, the curve that we have here, the graph, does ne never actually goes past the the vertical line y or sorry x equals nine. Everything is to the right of that line, and that that has to do with the fact that the domain is actually x is greater than 9. There there are no possible values we can plug into this formula when say x is equal to 5. That's that just doesn't exist. So so you can kind of see from the graph already where the domain is though we are able to find it easily enough by hand. But but it is nice to be able to connect the the picture of our of our curve of our graph to what we found algebraically. So our x values down here, our, our domain, correspond, correspond to what actually exists up here. In the same way, our range is going to correspond to what y values are, are across from the y-axis, or, or on this graph. So we could look at, say, what happens when y equals 10. When y equals 10, there is a point on our graph. Not entirely sure which which point it is. Maybe we could solve for it if we wanted to, but that's not really the point here. That's going to, but that basically says that ten is going to be in the range of our of this function. Similarly, we could say y equals seven, or y equals let's say six point five. In fact, six point five actually shows that we have two points on our graph. 
that's that's actually not a problem. We 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 only care about vertical lines not hitting it more than once. Horizontal lines are allowed to hit more than once. But the, but the point here is all those points, all those y values are in the range of this function. On the other hand, if I do y equals 5, it doesn't look like that's going to ever hit. Now, we can't guarantee necessarily that it never hits. Maybe, maybe this eventually comes back down way off the screen. We, we'd actually, actually have to do a little more work to find that out. In fact, that's one of the things that we'll be able to do in calculus, is determine how low can this actually get. It turns out the low point here is when y equals 6. That actually just touches here, and this curve, it comes down, touches that, touches it at y equals 6, and then never comes back down. It keeps going up from there. So that is the bottom point, and the range of this thing, so if we were to say, what was that, problem 20 I think it was? Yeah, problem 20. The range of this thing is all the y values at, that are at least 6. That does include 6. It does actually have have a value. It's uh, a, an x value that corresponds to y equals 6. Now we can write it this way, or we could say that y is in the real numbers, such that y is greater than or equal to 6. Or if we write this in interval notation we'd have from 6 to infinity and since we are including 6 this time we have a bracket here. But like I said from our graph that is seems pretty reasonable but actually proving that that is true making sure that is exactly correct is a little is kinda tricky. It, ta it does take some work and it's one of the things that we'll, we will learn how to, how to handle in, through the course of business calculus. It's called uh, finding the maximum or minimum point of, points on the curve. I'm going to go ahead and split up this section into two videos. Um, in, in this video, we, we just went over what the basics of functions. In the next video, we'll talk about different ways of combining functions together, different ways to construct various functions. But I'll, I'll see you in that video.